Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar called Phytosanitary Risk Management from Theory to Action. This is part of the launching of our good risk phytosanitary risk management practices workshop. This is an effort by a variety of different actors throughout our region, throughout the Latin American and Caribbean region. Also, this is the result of efforts by our teams at headquarters in Rome, and they have worked together creating uh, this course and uh, making it available to all of you. So the main objective of this webinar is to recognize the course content while also having a, an opportunity to exchange ideas with regard to risk management. We have a panel today of interesting guests. We will first hear from Choque Alduray, who is a who is from FAO's headquarters, who is a, a senior agricultural officer. And then we will hear from uh, someone else from the FAO office, regional office in Chile. And we will hear from members from the sub-regional office as well. Sarah Brunel is from the protection plant protection office as well for the phytosanitary national office and Aposis is the regional office of agriculture for fao's office in chile vanessa macrao is a specialist in vegetal uh, plant uh, health at fao's lac office also, we will hear from Javier Garay, who's a disaster risk reduction expert from FAO SLM. In order to begin this course, I would like to mention that, well, this is a launching of the phytosanitary risk management course from theory to action, but I would also like to mention that we have seen up to 40% loss of uh, crops, and we know that many of these are important for food security, such as rice, wheat, and others. Now, every year, the cost of plant disease and invasive insects exceeds $200 billion. This also results in a significant impact on the livelihoods of a growing number of small farmers and vulnerable populations located throughout our continent. Now, the scope and the magnitude of the phytosanitary risk in the LAC countries has increased over the last few years as a result of the closeness of biological threats and as well as the how they are setting up shop, one could say, metaphorically. We have very dangerous pests uh, such as the desert locusts that are extremely destructive in some of our countries. And then we also have the tropical breed of the banana disease. And this has also, again, hit our region. Now, in addition to that, we have seen an in increase frequency and intensity of adverse climate events and disruptions related to our climate that could also make worse these phytosanitary conditions. In fact, they may actually alter the behavior and uh, geographic location of these pests and how they interact with animals and uh, plants. So in order to face these challenges, it is absolutely essential to work together in an organized fashion and using solid, sound, scientific and technical information, all in order to better appropriately uh, manage the difficult situations and the phytosanitary uh, hazards and risks that emerge. We need to address the socioeconomic impact from an 
integrated approach. We know that phytosanitary risk management is a process that involves the systematic and coordinated efforts of the various uh, stakeholders of all public and private alike. This also involves uh, scientific information and innovation and technology. And we believe this is the appropriate framework to make sure we have more effective and efficient phytosanitary protocols, the way in which we are able to reduce risk and come up with the best possible response to these phytosanitary risks is actually working together with security to ensure that we include all of the various phytosanitary risk management elements so that we can make sure that we are securing national bio and food security. Now, this course meets those needs. And this is an initiative that will also allow us to reinforce the good phytosanitary risk management practices throughout the region. So I would like to thank the entire team, all the individuals who have uh, made this course possible and everyone joining us here today at the webinar so that we can move forward with risk management in our region. Thank you. Allow me to continue. I would like to refer to, give the floor to Lidia Peralta, who is from the FAO office in Mesoamerica. She will refer to the course content and objectives. Good morning, kindly. Put the presentation in presentation mode. Just waiting for this to be in presentation mode. This course, as mentioned by the previous speaker, is the result of the work of a variety of different experts and specialists from FAO. The course is the result of the experiences that we have had in our region with regard to plant aspects, but also experiences that are related to animal health and uh, risk management and disaster risk reduction. And of course, we have also uh, made use of the experience of the Rome team and the SPF and all the standards and guidelines that uh, we have all been working on over the years. So the course consists of four units. The first addresses the conceptual framework related to disaster risk reduction and phytosanitary risk management. The second unit addresses the peacetime phase and these concepts are the addressed are related to the peacetime phase and then the third unit is uh, related to emergency response and uh, preparedness or alert phase finalizing with the fourth unit which is the reconstruction phase now we have a uh, overall objective and the course aims to familiarize the users with the principles, concepts, measures, actions, and experiences that may contribute to allowing national authorities and technical experts from national and regional organizations working in the field of phytosanitary protection so that they may improve the implementation of this entire phytosanitary risk management process and boost their emergency responses with regard to plant health. As you can see, we have a list here of the uh, target audience, target market. We have the technical experts of national and regional phytosanitary protection organizations, the authorities as well from these organizations, uh, technical experts working in plant health and, and uh, those who are related to animal health as well, and companies involved in the uh, value chain and 
customers from a rather customs office as well, the university community. And we aim to uh, offer this course so that we can all contribute to disaster risk reduction. Next slide, please. You can see a course file on the public policy training hub. Next slide, please. And when you enter this side site, you will have to set up an account. You will also have access or will be able to see other courses that FAO has prepared. Next slide, please. And then when you actually enter the courses subsite, you will see a variety of different buttons that when clicking upon these will lead you to the different chapters in the course. Generally speaking, the course Next slide, please, also includes references so that all students will have access to additional supplementary information to expand their knowledge. Next slide, please. Each unit, as I mentioned, includes a list of references and other documents that these students will have access to directly. Now, again, we have some evaluations, some tests, one could say. Now, the key uh, purpose of these is to allow the students to further their knowledge, and one can repeat the evaluations often. So, in any event, this is a brief description of the course content and features, and we hope that you will participate in this course, and we believe that this will allow the uh, national and regional uh, phytosanitary risk management bodies to further their knowledge. Thank you, Ms. Peralta. Now let me give the floor to Angela Blanco, who's a specialist in risk management and resilience from FAO's LAC office. She has a presentation addressing the importance of including phytosanitary risk into the FAO resilience and emergency response programs. Go ahead, Angela, the floor is yours. Good morning. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can, thank you. Greetings to everyone joining us here today at this webinar. I would like to specifically welcome the experts on our panel, and I would also like to recognize everyone who has made it possible for us to launch this course, Phytosanitary Risk Management from Theory to Action. This is yet another effort aimed at expanding knowledge with regard to this topic area. And this is in addition to other FAO efforts. For example, the recently published course entitled Risk Reduction and Resilience in Phytosanitary Systems. Now, we are here to provide better information at all the levels at the uh, mitigation, preparation, and response level. We as you know, recently in Uruguay, more than 800 representatives from governments and regional and national organizations, civil society and academia met to address the disaster risk reduction concept and to address key aspects related to the commitments and strategies and necessary actions to actually reach the objectives under the Sendai framework. No, there's no doubt that this is extremely important for our region, that is risk management, particularly bearing in mind that we, that our region 
accounts for one out of every four disasters occurring globally. Now, over the last three decades, we have seen an increase in the number of events as well as increased frequency and impact. Now, risks also increase on a yearly basis practically throughout the entire region, and the figures of individuals affected are also quickly growing. Now, globally, the agricultural sector absorbs 26% of the impact of disasters, and this sector, our sector, is also affected by, the one most affected by extreme events in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have seen that the disaster patterns are increasingly more complex. This level of complexity is related to how the risks are increasingly interrelated and they also bring about this uh, waterfall effect. Now, climate change will also lead to an increased number and of events in terms of frequency and intensity, extreme events that is. And we also know that these are leading to a loss of biodiversity and are exacerbating a variety of different conflicts that have actually become the main uh, trigger of food insecurity worldwide. Drought also is extremely affecting our region. That's number one in the list of if of threats followed by flooding, storms, earthquakes, and landslides. Now, drought, despite being the top risk and threat in our region, is also tied to climate change. And there's a very close tie between drought and uh, crop pests and disease. Now, unfortunately, I'm dealing with some technical problems right now. Okay, things seem to have uh, cleared up. Now, extreme events also increase the intensity and distribution of pests. As Raisha mentioned in her welcoming remarks, studies have assessed the impacts of a variety of different atmospheric and climate factors, and we have seen that these have a direct impact on the expansion and appearance and abundancy of pests, as well as their severity. In this region, we have seen that this Pest is a clear example of the interconnection uh, of the various risks. Now, this bark pest has spread throughout the region, and for several years, it has had an impact on the forests in Central America. And we have seen that this bark weevil has grown in intensity as a result of protracted drought and heat waves because these bring about the perfect conditions for the bark weevil or beetle to reproduce uh, at a quicker rate. And efforts to mitigate and contain this pest have created a situation in which other pests and forests have uh, exacerbated. If there are some areas where forests weren't considered to be a major threat, but as a result of the appearance and expansion of this bark beetle, for example, in Belize, forests have taken on a, a higher, they are now more of a risk than in the past given that they have been used as efforts to mitigate this pest. So in recent years, we have seen how the uh, cross-border plant and animal diseases and pests actually uh, directly impact and uh, threaten, jeopardize food security and livelihoods. Now, COVID-19, as well as these other risks in a very short period of time have resulted in a situation in which we have seen a significant increase in the food insecurity of millions of individuals doing away quite quickly with all the progress that we have made in the past. This has also exacerbated vulnerabilities, inequalities, and has increased the number of individuals facing hunger. Now, we see that the most vulnerable individuals uh, are those who, uh, small farmers, for example, are those individuals whose uh, livelihoods and, and uh, 
are directly affected by pests. And clearly this has a significant impact on their domestic economies and their ability to uh, access foods. And we have seen this also brought about an increase in uh, food products, et cetera. Now, there was a recent assessment carried out by FAO on food insecurity in fragile regions throughout the region. And as a result, we have identified that for many small farmers, the top threat, in fact, are pests. And I'm referring to small farmers who absorb the major impact of crop disease and crop pests in a region where millions of individuals actually depend on agriculture for their existence and livelihoods. Now, this is a context in which we have seen growing demand for food. We have seen a growing, uh, growing food insecurity, economic pressures, climate change. And so the impact of the phytosanitary risks may actually be devastating to our food, to our agri-food systems, particularly for these small vulnerable farmers who do not have, an, who are not resilient enough to quickly bounce back from these losses. That is why we believe it is essential to address phytosanitary risks under our GRD efforts because this will allow us to come up with timely responses to the emergencies. Now, to that end, we have identified five keys. First of all, early warning systems. These allow us to detect and uh, warn others of the existence of these risks of the, of the producers and uh, the producer communities and everyone involved in those chains and the authorities. Now, as we have seen, it's very important to address how the various threats and pests are interlinked. We know that these pests are closely tied to uh, climate events and extreme events such as drought. We also know it's important to have anticipatory actions to make sure that these actions are defined in advance and that they are activated when the threats have been identified and announced through the early warning systems. It's important to have a plan to immediately resort to in the event that there is a threat that has been announced. It's also important to have anticipatory actions that are related to governance at all the various levels. All of these aspects are key. Let's not forget contingency plans. These provide us with uh, guidelines to reduce the uh, disaster risk as well as to prevent these uh, from uh, getting out of proportion and uh, scaling up. And it's also important to have timely responses, evaluation impacts as well. We need to understand the causes and effects as a result of all of these. And this also calls for close coordination. And then finally, the agricultural sector needs to have enough funds uh, and flexible funds that will allow the sector to mitigate the impact and to respond when it is just no longer inevitable and the mitigation is not an opportunity. Now, finally, I would like to mention that it is extremely important for us to ensure that the DRD approach be multifaceted. We know that cross-border situations may be more complex and their impact is increasingly more evident. So that, in addition to the waterfall effect, uh, will make it increasingly more difficult to, to address the problem. So re boosting resiliency and having uh, anticipatory actions will allow us to assist those individuals who are at a greater uh, threat and risk. So it's important also to have research and data and to make sure that we have clear available information. This is crucial. We also need to assess the direct and indirect damages and loss and to plan in advance for these contingencies. That's why coordination, cooperation, and exchanging information and practices are all essential steps. This is what FAO has been doing for several years now in this region, together with other international organizations, all in order to try to contain uh, FOBR4. Also, I would like to mention that we have a commitment 
we are committed to the Sendai framework uh, related to disaster risk reduction. And with regard to this commitment, substantially reducing phytosanitary risk and the losses resulting from the cross-border crop disasters and disease are a key part of what FAO does. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, for this excellent presentation that we will be discussing later on. I, I'd like to offer the floor to Esther Lilia Peralta, a plant health consultant for Mesoamerica region, discussing key elements in phytosanitary risk management. Go ahead, uh, Esther, the floor is yours. Hello again. And uh, thank you for the possibility of uh, sharing uh, some of the key elements in phytosanitary risk management. Next one, please. If you could show this as a presentation mode. Well, the increasing uh, record of outbreaks of cross-border uh, pests, uh, also the significant increase of uh, pests that, that are established in several areas and even uh, the modification of distribution and behavior uh, that are having place right now are part of uh, the current uh, trends related to uh, plant uh, uh, disease. In our continent, as you may see, we have several examples in the last few years in different crops, uh, impacting different crops. And one of the most recent examples is the uh, Fusarium uh, tropical breed for which we have worked in coordination with different national uh, phytosanitary protection agencies. Next one, please. In this scenario, uh, managing phytosanitary risk contributes uh, to guiding the efforts of uh, public and private sectors regarding uh, comprehensive and coordinated measures to prevent and reduce uh, the degree of exposure to these uh, vulnerabilities and uh, risks and threats to increase uh, preparation uh, and response uh, to reduce uh, losses because of these dangerous events, improving recovery, and of course, uh, reinforcing resilience. As you may see, the cycle of risk management uh, covers uh, four different stages in which uh, different uh, actions are developed. And one of them, uh, which is very important, is uh, the um, peace uh, time. There is not uh, technical aspects, but also operational aspects. The next one, please. Although uh, phytosanitary risk uh, is conceptualized in different ways, even in, among different industries, uh, the definition that you read here on the screen is the one that is internationally agreed by United Nations that has been adapted to the phytosanitary context. Uh, what really matters here is to understand that risk uh, is a function of the risks you see on, this, on the screen, a, a threat, a biological threats in this case, also defined uh, as those uh, pests uh, with the epidemic potential and capability of uh, causing uh, economic, uh, environmental uh, losses on the livelihoods of uh, farmers in uh, the national as well as uh, global context. The second one is exposure, understood as uh, the vegetal species, uh, the production areas, uh, people, assets of uh, farming uh, value chains that are exposed uh, to these threats. The third one, vulnerability uh, given by processes or factors, economic, social, environmental uh, factors that increase the susceptibility of crops, of people, sectors, and the areas that are exposed. And uh, capabilities, which is the combination of strengths, uh, features, and resources that are available uh, to uh, manage and reduce um, phytosanitary risks and increase resilience. Next one, please. So the phytosanitary risk analysis 
is the uh, initial activity in risk management and the one that guides many of the actions that or measures that need to be adopted. That's why it's so important to deepen in uh, into those components, as you may see, uh, regarding their interaction, uh, including also, as Angela said, uh, the risk drivers that may um, increase the exposure levels and vulnerability levels and reduce uh, the capability or the capacity, such as the case of uh, climate change and of even modifying the threats themselves. These are two charts that I've, um, I'm showing here to consider the introduction of technology tools into these uh, risk analysis um, and us to establish uh, certain patterns and relationships uh, that help us support uh, the risk reduction uh, and risk management measures. That, that's why it's so important to also consider interactions. Next one. Now we're going to touch uh, some of the key uh, aspects, of course, not all of them. And this first one is related to prevention, which is quite relevant uh, to uh, prevent an, uh, an event to become an emergency. Uh, phytosanitary emergency, and to also uh, prevent other secondary threats uh, to um, take place and to also cause these consequences. So as, is, as you see here, this considers uh, entry point uh, uh, disinfection and inspection measures, uh, quarantines, uh, sanitation, certification, biosafety measures, etc. All of this uh, means what we are working on currently in the region. And uh, one must uh, highlight that uh, investment is needed uh, for prevention and for uh, resilience uh, is absolutely profitable, by the way. Next one. Preparation. Preparation is one uh, core aspect as well. It's four components that you see here include different aspects such as uh, updating of the legal framework, the coordination and procedures necessary to guarantee good operation of the command uh, chain and governance coordination among uh, different sectors, uh, preparation of response plans and contingency plans, uh, recovery plans, and also in general, uh, technical and operational procedures, um, ensuring uh, the availability of material and human resources, training that is needed, considering officials uh, to producers, uh, and also considering communicators as well, and uh, assessing the operation of all this that has been prepared uh, regarding resources and procedures uh, through the simulations and drills. Uh, it, the experience we've gathered in Latin America and uh, with the significant uh, of involvement of OIS, uh, it is quite satisfactory and it keeps improving. Next one. In the response, well, response is key uh, to be able to uh, control an emergency or a dangerous event. But uh, there are several elements, but I'd like to highlight here the coordination and public and private co-responsibility for executing the response procedures with an emphasis on the eradication, containment, diagnostic, and follow-up of the different responses. We see uh, ex excellent examples in Colombia, for example, uh, to respond uh, to uh, the uh, breathe for tropical uh, pest. Um, uh, this uh, phase has not been worked on significantly. We have significant re results, uh, though, in our continent. Uh, after an emergency that was was not avoided, uh, the objective is to be to to build build back better, improving all those aspects that were deficient at some point, and increasing re resilience of farmers, communities and the industry uh, by integrating uh, risk reduction measures uh, in all these uh, strategies uh, that uh, I've shown, uh, the phytosanitary strategy for uh, production, marketing, and support to the communities and the farmers that uh, include, for example, training, 
uh, digitization of processes in the communities, establishing maintenance and verification of uh, areas that are free of these pests, uh, better technologies uh, for surveillance, uh, for comprehensive management, uh, for uh, soil health and the use of um, quality seeds, um, biosafety techniques, especially the ones that have been improved, improving uh, the varieties in the crops uh, conversion of certain areas and when it is not possible to find or to achieve eradication, the uh, follow-up as well uh, of uh, commercial indicators from the technical point of view, negotiations, when one needs to reopen markets, for example, the analysis of new uh, marketing opportunities uh, and uh, the support of scientific research and innovation, which is very important in uh, this stage of uh, reconstruction and recovery stage. Um, just in closing, uh, I'm leaving you with some thoughts, um, but I'd like to highlight uh, specifically the importance of linking our efforts uh, on risk management and uh, the, uh, the, the, the the care for phytosanitary uh, emergencies there to national and regional systems uh, for uh, disaster risk reduction and management uh, because of the benefits they entail uh, for uh, agriculture, for farming. Uh, thank you very much. Next one. Just to thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you, Esther. And uh, now uh, let me introduce uh, a presentation, surveillance, early warning system and prediction of the desert locust as part of uh, part of phytosanitary risk reduction by Shoki Aldobai, who is a, a senior uh, officer of the Plant Production and Protection Division um, in Rome. Shoki, you have the floor. Thank you, Raisha. And uh, good afternoon, and good morning for some colleagues. And uh, I am very happy to be with you today at this very important webinar. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, share, let's say, some information and also my presentation on the desert locust uh, early warning uh, and monitoring systems. So I hope you see my presentation now. Correct? No, yet. Okay. What is going on? Let me see. Okay. Again, two. Now it's fine. You see it now. Let me just put it in. Okay, good. Uh, okay, thanks again. So my presentation will be about uh, our FAO's uh, desert locust monitoring and early warning and forecasting system that we are running from here, from FAO headquarters in Rome. And we are connected with the uh, desert locust control units at the uh, countries, breeding countries and invasion countries of the desert locust. Uh, at the beginning of the my presentation, just to share with you key facts about the importance of the desert locust. As you know, the desert locust is considered the most dangerous migratory pest that is uh, attacking more than, let's say, 500 plant species. It doesn't uh, differentiate between the crops or any uh, uh, other, let's say, plants. So it's very voracious uh, pest that can consume every day two uh, grams uh, uh, from, this, uh, from the plants. And uh, one swarm, let's say, with one kilometer, one kilometer can consume uh, 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 as much as food as 35,000 people per day. So you can imagine how voracious it is, how, how it is very dangerous for the 
uh, food security. And you imagine that one kilometer, one square kilometer can have 40 to 80 million locusts. And uh, it is very, uh, let's say, uh, fast. It has very uh, high migration capability that can every day can migrate and fly up to maybe from 150 to up to 200 kilometers with the support of wind, of course. And uh, in addition to the, his, uh, it's a very high uh, reproduction capability. Then again, also about the area that are uh, affected by the desert locusts, as you see from this map, it, it is covering uh, around 30 countries that are considering as um, breeding and invasion countries is from starting from south from Senegal, Mauritania, up to borders of India and Pakistan. So uh, we can say that the area can be affected by the desert locust covers 20% uh, of the, the earth land. Sometime in during the upsurge and also the plagues can be expanded up to 60 countries. Now, what is the, the FAO mechanism to uh, control and monitor the desert locust? We have at the ground, we have three desert locust regional commissions that are operating in all these 30 countries from uh, West Africa, the Desert Locust Commission for West Africa, West and North Africa. Then we have with 10 countries, and then the Central Region Desert Locust Commission with 16 countries, which is the biggest one. And then the, th the, four, the third one is the small, the smallest one, but the oldest one is for Southwest Asia with four countries, Iran, Pakistan, India and, and uh, Afghanistan. And from here, from headquarters, we are running the Desert Locust Information Service, the LIS, where we are also collecting all information from the field and also uh, analyzing them and turning them to the alerts and also update. So the key issue to control and uh, effectively uh, keep the desert locusts under control is the monitoring and early warning, of course. So to have very good successful, let's say early warning, timely early warning, we need to have very good setup of the field uh, uh, survey and monitoring. And this is what we have uh, uh, through our the regional commissions, they are ensuring the countries, they are doing this regular survey because we need to have a regular survey. Always we have, in the, as you see in the map, in these country, breeding countries, we have different, let's say, breeding uh, areas. We have the uh, uh, winter breeding areas here in, in, in uh, blue, and then we have the spring breeding areas in green, and then we have summer breeding areas. So. Uh, we are supporting the countries in these all breeding uh, areas to uh, uh, have a regular surveys and also to submit daily, let's say, reports in real time. So rapid collection and transmission of data, they are the key for having, let's say, early warning uh, successful to these countries. Uh, all this, let's say, real time, uh, information uh, collection are supported by our systems that we developed and uh, we are running this uh, all systems uh, from the country level let's say we developed the uh, uh, field tools we call them maybe you heard about elocus 3 tablet that is used by the uh, survey teams in these countries breeding countries where they can collect the information and transmit it in real time when we are saying real time, we receive this information from the field directly because this Elocus 3 tablet is supported through the satellite. So we receive the real time information and data from the field. And then to support the Elocus 3 tablet, we developed uh, another three additional uh, devices, which is a mobile application that we developed during the uh, Desert Locus upsurge in 2020. So this digital locus application is now we call it Elocus 3M, and anyone can download it uh, and uh, use it through the smartphone. And we developed also Garmin based and other devices to be used. Again, this advantage of Garmin because it is linked to the satellite, so the information is uh, 
transmitted in real time while you know the mobile application if you have connection in the field you can send the information if not then uh, the information is stored and then when you go back to your office it will be automatically trans uh, transferred to support also the locust um, uh, survey team because you know this desert locust uh, breeding can be also in very remote areas or inaccessible areas because of some conflicts or security so we developed also the drone uh, technology to help to help the uh, survey uh, control teams and now these drones are operational so then this the data that are we are collecting as i mentioned they are transferred to uh, the system what we call it ramses gis which is the this uh, system is Ba uh, on national, let's say, database for the national desert locus information officers to uh, analyze the data received from the field. And then this uh, data are transferred to our, we call it Swarm GIS, which is the global uh, system here at headquarters, where we are analyzing all these data and turning them into the bulletins and also alerts and so on and through our websites and uh, alerting systems. So uh, all these data are analysis, uh, analyzed also based on the uh, our system, the GIS, uh, the Swarm GIS system. Ramses are supported by different, let's say, uh, models that we, what we are using for uh, remote sensing models and Earth observations, because we are using the uh, data of rainfall in these breeding areas, also the status of the vegetation and also soil moisture and uh, we have two systems or two satellites we are using for soil moisture monitoring one is provided by lobelia uh, in spain and also the one from nasa all this information and maps that already are uh, integrated in our system so people when they go to the field they can open these uh, devices they can have all this information there and then uh, the the data and also uh, collected they are automatically turned into uh, maps like this one and uh, the status of the vegetation soil moisture and also the rainfall precipitation is the are the key to guide also the desert locust survey teams where to go and to, to uh, survey for for the desert locust breeding and also the um, uh, reproduction activities so uh, we supported also our current models with new models that are uh, giving information on the seasonal, let's say, precipitation that we are giving the, some uh, per precipitation forecast for six weeks and then also for six weeks, uh, six months that are supporting the forecasting capacity of the desert locust uh, control units in the countries and we developed also kind of trajectory model that can give estimation of the um, migration of uh, uh, locust we have we we do have a trajectory and dispersal also model that can show the, esti the estimated uh, let's say destination of the migration of these swarms when we have swarms so this is, uh, in short, the uh, combination, let's say, or the uh, structure of our system. So we start from collecting the data from the field, then data analysis. We developed also the data, we call it data cube. This is was developed, this system was developed uh, in, in support of uh, Scriptoria in UK, which uh, now contain the historical data uh, for 70 years. So if you go, to our system in low cost hub, you log in to this data cube, you can have all this historical data since I think one, uh, on the, uh, 1960, uh, 1936. So more than 70 years data, they are available in this system. Okay, and then uh, in addition to this, more information I can give you about the desert locust drones that we really uh, have been working to have this really customized uh, drone with the long uh, endurance. It's, it can fly up to 100 kilometer. It is equipped with all system linked to the Elocust uh, three uh, systems and also swarms, uh, uh, swarm JAS and uh, and also uh, the uh, uh, Ramses JS. We already 
uh, have these drones operational in many countries in the in West Africa, Central uh, region, which is uh, Near East and also East Africa. It's very effective, it's very helpful also to reach the areas that are cannot be reached by the ground teams. And then we, uh, with, in collaboration with ESRI, we developed the low-cost hub where we have up-to-date uh, data. Anyone can access this low-cost hub. You can see the situation, all these operations in the field, the situation of the desert low-cost uh, uh, breathing and so on. Another uh, tool that we developed during the upsurge is the dashboard that monitoring also the operations, resources put in the field and uh, used by each of the these countries. This is just to increase also the transparency uh, towards our donors and also uh, member countries. Then the final, let's say, product of all this information uh, system, we are, uh, I, I think you know that we have a very uh, famous Locus Watch, that website where we are having up-to-date information. Uh, this information is updated monthly and during the recession period like now but during the uh, outbreak and upsurge we are updating it, this uh, locus watch with the information uh, in, on a weekly basis sometime even twice per week it depends on the development of the situation you can find in this locus watch all information regarding the desert locust in addition to the monthly bulletins that we are producing every month based on the information that we are receiving in the, from the countries. We are turning all this information from the system to this bulletin. The bulletin show also the situation. And when you, you see the, uh, the green here, I mean, it's, it shows that uh, the situation is under threat. If it is green, I mean, if it is orange, if it is, cal it is calm, then it is green. And if it is red, then it is uh, under, I mean, dangerous situation. These are kind of maps that we are uh, producing from our systems, like uh, the Swarm GIS and so on. And you can visit our website, of course, the Desert Locust Watch for up-to-date information and all documents and all guidelines and all relevant publications uh, related to the Desert Locust uh, Control. This, again, just to show the link to different uh, website what I presented before, the low cost hub, low cost watch, and also the dashboard. With this, I would like to thank you. I will be happy to answer any question or provide any information and try just to make it short as I had only 10 minutes for the presentation. Thank you again. Thank you, Choki. Entonces, daremos paso a alguna de las preguntas. So we'll probably start then with some of the questions. Eh, en el panel. Eh, por the nuestra panel. parte, nos gustaría eh, like pre preguntar a la ask, señora uh, Vanessa Mack, especialista Ms. en sanidad uh, vegetal, uh, en sanidad Mask, animal para FAO Health, Chile. For ¿Nos pudiera Chile? comentar cómo Could se están preparando los países eh, kind of en la preparación y respuesta in, a emergencias uh, zoosanitarias? Uh, zoosanitary threats. Hola. Um, mucho gusto. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to take part in this important event. Greetings to all. So first of all, I would like to apologize on behalf of Andres Gonzalez, Animal Health and Livestock Specialist for FAO LAC for not being able to be here today with you. Now, as Raisa said and Esther, today we are facing a variety of different emergency situations and obviously animal health and uh, cross border plant and animal disease are no exception to this. In fact, we are facing a variety of different situations such as uh, avian flu and the African um, porcine disease. And we have been working closely with the different countries and ministries 
with regard to cross-border diseases, you need to have a regional or sub-regional approach because obviously disease does not abide by border controls. And we have the GEM manual, which is a uh, manual of good emergency management practices. We actually have a free online course available in English, French, Spanish on our website today with regard to this. Moreover, this is similar to what Esther was saying. We also have a phased approach because the goal is to prepare the countries during peacetime and then have the early warning systems launched and then to best address emergencies when they occur. And then finally wrap it all up with a reconstruction phase or reestablishment phase focusing on bringing animal health measures back into control for exports and for the benefit of food security, etc. So we work in four key areas, preparation, prevention, early detection, and response. These are the four key pillars for emergencies, animal health and otherwise. We've also been working with some of the countries throughout the region in this progressive emergency preparedness approach, which is actually based on this emergency management manual that I referred to. And this involves a variety of different veterinary services and questions and surveys to see how well prepared the veterinary services are, whether they have governance systems in place, whether they have good uh, emergency response preparedness sy systems, etc. who are the various stakeholders involved, the, the health sector, emergency response sector, etc. So the questionnaires are aimed to determine whether or not they have teams that are well prepared and trained. Moreover, we provide constant uh, training and testing for the emergency phase. And when you're already in that phase, it's very difficult to respond respond appropriately, if you do not have well-trained officers, if you do not have an early detection system, it's difficult to, to respond uh, well if you do not lay the groundwork in advance. So animal health sector today is facing a variety of different contingencies. For example, we have uh, emergency response teams to address the uh, highly contagious avian flu that is uh, really uh, hitting a variety of different um, countries today. We also have the African porcine fever or plague that is affecting some countries throughout the region. And we have projects to provide support to these uh, affected countries and other programs to best coordinate emergency response. And also we have emergency response teams in Guatemala and Peru with regard to an FAO global program, which is an emergency center for cross-border animal disease response. And uh, this center is uh, addressing animal disease as well as uh, antibiotic resistance. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. As you mentioned today, we are facing a very challenging situation, animal and plant health situation. We know that the African porcine fee fever is affecting uh, many countries and we have the highly contagious avian flu as well. Now, all of these steps are helpful uh, and lay the groundwork for uh, other actions with regard to phytosanitary risk management. Now let me give the floor, or let me let me ask Ana Bosas to refer to the various mechanisms in existence today with regard to risk management and how we can ensure that we are able to scale up the use of these risk management mechanisms in our region. Thank you, Raisa, for your question. 
prior to answering the question, I would like to thank the speakers before me for their valuable presentations. Now, with regard to your question, I think there's something very important here with regard to public policy, but primarily with regard to public policy that uh, one can translate into investments earmarked for uh, programs to address the phytosanitary risks, but also to address institutional strengthening with regard to how the protection systems work and are rolled out, and also with regard to capacity building at the various levels, uh, stakeholders involved in prevention and uh, risk response. So it's important to have a public policy rolled out in practice, but also uh, to make sure that there's an enabling environment that would allow for these risk management actions to be taken and rolled out well. Now, there's something else that's very important, and that is when you are responding to this type of emergency or any type of emergency, you must understand that this is not a unilateral effort. And in that regard, part of the public policy efforts need, really need to include a multi-sectoral approach from within the public sector, but also including public-private partnerships, because that is essential, an essential feature for scaling up, but for ensuring that you have a, a standing approach and response measures for these types of emergencies, whether they're phytosanitary or other types of emergencies. So first you need to have public policy, you need to have investments, and you need to have instruments, uh, public policy instruments as well, that hopefully will be translated into, into multi-sectoral planning that in turn will allow for identifying the mechanisms, resources, and necessary logistics to be prepared. Now, all of this also entails, as mentioned by Esther and Vanessa, this entails recognizing and identifying the threats. What is our level of exposure? And also what are our capacities and how well will we be able to plan? Moreover, it's important to have information that will allow us to better predict or forecast events because this will allow us to better design the necessary resources, logistics, and response required. Finally, it's important to design, set up, or consolidate reporting mechanisms. Now, if you can consolidate your reporting mechanism with your surveillance system, your monitoring system, your warning system, and your prediction system, you will be well prepared. It's all part of this larger ecosystem. And this also involves a governance structure, a knowledge management system, and evidence, all of which will allow you to better plan and ensure that you have investments that are really results-based and also uh, ha are carried out under risk prevention approach. Because we know the impact of phytosanitary risks on uh, our livelihoods and on health, et cetera. Thank you, Anna. It's very important to underscore the value of everything that is related to biosanitary risk management and how investments and policy instruments, public policies are all key components that will allow us to make progress with regard to these mechanisms. Now, in that regard, and also tying this into what is being carried out today regionally, I would like to give the floor to Javier Garay, who is our focal point in Mesoamerica for risk management. and. Uh, I would like to hear from him with regard to what our region has been doing for phytosanitary and zoosanitary aspects and how we can link these to the actions carried out within the realm of anticipatory action. So, Javier Garay, you have the floor to uh, reply. Hi, Raisha. Greetings to everyone present here today. Allow me to for first congratulate the team for uh, developing this course and launching the course. It has it is a wonderful culmination of the experience uh, in existence and 
in order to best address phytosanitary disease and pest. This will allow us to work together uh, under uh, a preventative approach to better address the impact of these diseases. Now, I am speaking to you from Uruguay. My connection is not that great, unfortunately, but I am here in Uruguay and I am, I am uh, taking part in a UN conference in the region relative to risk management. Now, it is true that phytosanitary risks are not uh, underscored. There's no presentation relative to these uh, risks, but we do know that they have a significant impact on the producers, on their health, on their livelihoods, and this is all part of a waterfall effect. And these risks might not be prioritized in terms of uh, the overarching uh, climate related risks, but they are nonetheless important. And uh, it's important to have a holistic approach to risk management. Now there's that. And then we have many lessons learned thus far with regard to risk management. I think these are quite decisive in terms of the success of any operation. Now, we are now feeding this information back to our producers. We have different tools that allow us to conduct uh, periodic surveys with the users, with the producers, to understand what is their degree of food insecurity, to understand the risks that they're facing. And uh, we're doing this in Guatemala, El Salvador, and other areas. We need to integrate that to with the response being rolled out. This will be having risk management will be decisive. Our risk management capacity is essential. We need to prioritize and then simplify. When you're facing a risk or many risks, it's impossible to uh, do well unless you uh, prioritize. It will also be important to understand how we can integrate our early warning systems with our communication mechanisms, with our the instructions uh, that we issue regarding risk management. We have these lovely structures, but we make must make sure that they are activated and put into action decisively to address different risks. The early warning systems are quite valuable. Often we focus on making sure that decision makers have the right information, but it goes beyond the high level decision makers, we need to make sure that the people on the ground, the farmers have the information so that they know how to best prepare their soil, their land, their crops and when to uh, plant, etc. So we need to make sure that the early warning systems issue information to the farmers on the ground so that they can better address the potential impacts from the moment the early warning is issued up until the end. This is very decisive. Thank you, Javier. And uh, as we always say, in terms of uh, phytosanitary risk uh, management systems, it's precisely what we're discussing now. It's a huge challenge to make progress in all these platforms, and especially uh, how to further reduce the impact uh, on the livelihoods, especially uh, and for um, nutrition and uh, food security. I'd like to offer the floor to Sarah Bonnell from the International Convention on Phytosanitary Protection Commission. And we'd like to know your approach uh, from the uh, 
CIPF of what we're doing today in terms of uh, phytosanitary risk management uh, and how to um, support our countries regarding uh, phytosanitary risk management. So uh, go ahead, Sarah, the floor is yours. Sarah, can you hear me? We have uh, questions on the chat as well of the for the participants in the panel. There's a question for Chucky linked to uh, how uh, can you uh, how could we do this in Latin America? A similar program as uh, compared to the Desert Locust uh, experience, and if this. Uh, App that is or these systems developed for the desert locust. Do you think they could be used in other regions for other types of um, problems and threats? Yeah, thanks, uh, Aisha, for this question. I think it's possible. Huh? I think there is um, a system right now there in your region. Uh, I have been uh, exchanging also with the locust uh, officers there, uh, Hector Medina and. And uh, there is a similar system, but of course, the technology what we have can be also customized to any other type of locust because a locust uh, 3M, what we developed uh, originally for desert locust, we used it also in other regions. We customized it for migratory, Africa migratory locust and also other species. Similar system we are running also for the uh, other region, we have a program for Central Asia and Caucasus. We developed also similar system for this region where they have three other type of locust, uh, Asian migratory locust and Italian locust and Moroccan. So we'll be uh, ready for any collaboration with the region to help in putting a system. Thanks. Here I have among a few other questions for Esther, for example, how important it is the period prior to an alert and the occurrence of a phytosanitary emergency and um, what's called um, normal or peacetime. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Peacetime or normal period, as we call it, uh, within that cycle, of risk management is precisely um, the time when we work on risk reduction, on mitigation of, of some of the effects of some other dangerous events, but also it plays a significant role in preparation as well. Uh, as Vanessa said, and uh, as I presented in my uh, first presentation, and of other activities uh, such as uh, prevention and detection uh, as to preparation um, will we include all planning uh, plan preparation but also support from the point of view of the legal uh, updated legal framework uh, these are the contingency response uh, plans uh, recovery plans uh, general procedures and something very important which is uh, coordination uh, articulation uh, preparation uh, to uh, develop an efficient uh, command chain and a governance that is also inclusive because that is also very important from the uh, point of view of preparation as to prevention, we see that what what uh, what it intends to do is to avoid having an emergency. That is the main purpose, and uh, somehow that also includes, to a large extent, the increased in phytosanitary capacity of our uh, phytosanitary protection agencies and institutions, and of our countries uh, in general. Now, as to detection during that period. Um, 
diagnostic capacity is improved in our uh, surveillance programs, uh, either specific or general. Um, try to find out how the uh, pests are moving or migrating that can be very dangerous and that uh, not only having to do with the work that is done in the field but they also relate to the kind of work that has been called uh, phytosanitary intelligence which is uh, the uh, follow-up of how uh, uh, a group of pests are moving what is their distribution uh, or how some of them have changed in terms of their features and uh, their distribution and behavior due to uh, the impact of climate change and uh, temperature variations, for example, uh, precipitation, droughts, and other areas, uh, for example. So I believe that's what's really important of a peacetime, which starts with risk analysis, uh, because in all other phases, there are, there's also an update of the risk analysis according to uh, the uh, conditions, uh, specific conditions. But at this first stage, that's when risk uh, is strategically analyzed. Uh, as we had said, uh, because we go, we, we'll delve deeper into the, each one of the risk components and their interactions is important because it guides, from the scientific and technical point of view, it guides the kinds of decisions that we need to make. What are the best, uh, measures uh, uh, for reducing uh, the um, phytosanitary risk. This is what I can say. Some more questions from the chat, Anna. If you, I'm, I'm going to uh, read the question. And if other colleagues in the panel would like to uh, also contribute. Uh, what is the impact of the lack of political will in public administration in order to come up with efficient and effective uh, public policies that prioritize resilience and risk management? Thank you, Raisa, for your question. I think uh, the lack of will at all levels, not only in terms of public administration, uh, definitely increases uh, the impacts of any situation, I believe that is uh, something that needs to be highlighted first. Uh, the level of impacts are magnified by the fact of uh, not having the uh, preparation uh, mechanisms uh, when faced with these situations. And something important as well is the issue of, for example, not being able to come up with the evidence that would allow us to measure the costs of inaction uh, in terms of managing phytosanitary risks and the generation of evidence and the mechanisms and information and knowledge creation should also allow to um, build awareness among the authorities, but also the stakeholders chain. But as we heard at the beginning, it is not something that depends on a single stakeholder, but it is a chain of stakeholders as part of the prevention and response system. Uh, so building awareness, uh, specifically, by assessing what is the cost of lack of action and of being ready uh, to manage these risks. Uh, I think that uh, should uh, uh, help increase the level of uh, political will throughout the entire chain and the governance systems or this type of systems. Thank you, Anna. There's another question on the chat and it's open for anyone who would like to answer. What if effect of influence does climate change have on the beginning of combined events such as uh, phytosanitary events and uh, the impact on um, primary agro and livestock uh, activities in the value chain precisely what anna was just starting to comment um, in her previous answer linked to the value chain and risk management chain i'd like to offer the floor to other members of the panel, or maybe if Anna, if you'd like to take it also. Raisa, I can start. Go ahead. I think, I believe, um, both Anna and Angela and Javier as well could also uh, show us some elements, and Shoki as well, that I believe has a lot of experience in this sense. Um, what I wanted to say first uh, in this regard 
is that climate change and temperature changes in terms of uh, rainfall behavior, moisture content of the soil, etc., have a huge influence. Uh, first on pests, but not only on them, but also on the physiology of, of those pests, the vectors or biological drivers and their behavior. That is to say, we see now that those changes might even modify their own distribution patterns and their own behavior in the interaction thereof, uh, the interaction between plants and, pla and pests. Uh, and of course, uh, among all the different drivers. Uh, this means that climate change uh, only for a specific threat or for a specific pest uh, has a huge importance. And this is uh, very much related as well to the creation of or, or the existence of problems such as drought. So that entail a number of other risks, among them pests uh, that can grow in terms of numbers or population or grow in terms of impact. So I, I'll stop there because uh, uh, many of our uh, guests, of course, will uh, probably make other contributions. Thank you, Esther. Uh, I don't know. Yes, please, Anna, go ahead. Maybe um, uh, along the lines with what Esther said, but it's also important to highlight that climate change uh, is also enabling other geographic regions precisely because of the changes in terms of temperature, for example. And uh, that has uh, facilitated uh, the permanence of certain pests that in the past we didn't see. So um, climate change is also changing uh, as Esther said, uh, the distribution patterns, but also their reproductive cycles. So we need to, we have more reproductive cycles uh, uh, as an effect of climate change. Now, we need to highlight, um, I think, the, the kind of practices that are taking place, the type of agricultural practices, and in that sense, what is the level of resilience of production uh, systems that are, for example, uh, monocrops are to uh, towards a more diverse crop system, or oh, as Esther said, of uh, for example, uh, favoring the uh, persistence of beneficial insects. Uh, there are certain manners of actually countering uh, the effects of um, the effects of climate change on uh, pests. Shoki, if you'd like to supplement uh, these concepts, go ahead, Shoki. Yes, thanks, Rasha. No, I fully agree what has been said by colleagues Anna and also Esther about the climate change. It has very huge impact huh, on the development of the pest and also uh, spread and magnitude of these uh, outbreaks. It was very clear that behind this very um, uh, bad upsurge that we were witnessing in three, almost two regions of the desert locus was behind the climate change, of course, because we we had two cyclones in 2018 that hit uh, the area of uh, empty quarter in the Arabian Peninsula that resulted in uh, a, a breeding of locusts in such remote area. What was was not, let's say, possible to control to control or to survey. Again, then. The third uh, uh, cyclone uh, hit also Horn of Africa that again created favorable conditions, especially in these countries, Horn of Africa, they were not even prepared for desert locusts. They didn't see any breeding for desert locusts, for example, Somalia Ethiopia, for 25 years. I'm not saying also Kenya for 70 years, they didn't have locusts. They forget even about this. So really, I mean, the, the, the Climate impact is very challenging. I mean, the climate change is very challenging in terms of the altering also the uh, breeding spread of this pest. And uh, nowadays with this climate change, we are witnessing a lot of this uh, resurgence of this pest. Then another aspect also, I agree with uh, Esther about the, the drought. We, we, we witnessed this also. I mean, we finished the um, control of the upsurge in uh, Horn of Africa, especially Somalia, Ethiopia, last year, uh, the beginning of last year. And then suddenly well, the, the drought came. 
So this region was suffering double, let's say, crisis. We, it was just, I mean, first of all, was uh, because of the climate change. We, they had this, the breeding of desert locust. The desert locust finished because of the drought, then they were suffering another crisis. And this is a very good example of how the, uh, the climate change can affect, let's say, the, the population and also uh, the, the dynamic of, of the uh, agriculture sector and also the spread of the pest. Thanks. Go ahead, Angela. Thank you, Raisha and Shoki and uh, others. You have uh, provided very comprehensive replies to the question. I just wanted to add to the last aspect that Shoki mentioned, and that is that actually, yes, we are facing a situation in which we are able to demonstrate the effects and the interrelated impact of these on our farmers. And we see that they, they're they compounded. And uh, these are often, we know that these are related to climate change as well, in many cases. Now, I think that what we still need is more evidence. Research has shown that actually there is a tie between extreme events triggered by climate change. These are increasingly more intense and frequent. For example, the effect of drought on pests and plagues. And as Anna said, we do need to have greater information and a more of an understanding with regard to to what extent, what percentage, one could say, of these changes are related to climate events and what percentage are related to other variables or factors, for example, uh, land management. Uh, we know that some of the practices now are more uh, aimed at uh, uh, sustainability, resilience, and to what extent does risk knowledge or risk management come into play or governance, etc. There are a series of variables that also need to be taken into consideration. As a result, we recommend working more uh, along the lines of a holistic approach that would provide us with more knowledge with regard to the causes and the effects of these plant pests and diseases that have really had a significant impact on us in the region. Thank you, Angela, and the rest of the colleagues for answering this question. There are several questions in the chat, but we do not have much time. We need to move on to the closure. But I did want to point out something that several people have mentioned in the chat, and that is the need to work in a coordinated fashion to not uh, double up on efforts carried out throughout the region. I think that we have over the last two years, worked closely with the various uh, international organizations and the WFP, uh, et cetera. And we have done what is possible to not double up on actions throughout the region. And we have also taken advantage of the resources available regionally and globally. I would just like to, again, invite you to sign up for this course, to share this course with other colleagues working in the public and private sectors that you may have contact with and individuals you know working in risk management. So again, make sure you register for the course. We have all received different mails. The information is quite user-friendly. And uh, we're also uh, publishing this on the YouTube channel. So thank you again to all of the participants here, the presenters and uh, others who have provided their two cents. Thank you to the individuals who have organized the event as well. Thank you for your significant efforts and the multidisciplinary teams who have been involved in preparing this phytosanitary risk management course from theory to action. And again, thank you to all the colleagues who have joined us here today at this webinar. I wish you an excellent afternoon and we will see you soon. Hope to see you uh, signing up.